morning. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, welcome to this uh, to this session. Uh, I'm Michael McLean, a priest of the Archdiocese for now for almost 38 years, and I've worked in all sorts of different aspects of the church life, mostly in parishes, and I've always had a, a big heart for the work of catechists, being taught by the catechists in my own parish, in both primary and in secondary school. It was a great privilege, and they were wonderful people. And one of them, um, I remember later in life, she was uh, a parishioner of mine, and I had the privilege of, of uh, helping her to commend her, her loving husband to the grace and mercy of God. And so it was a great opportunity to give something back to catechists who'd given me so much. So thank you for, you, for the work you do and for the great witness that you give us. All right? And I know that the work of the catechists is sometimes difficult, but in praying this morning, I, I happened to read... Uh, a passage from the Sacred Scriptures from, from the First Corinthians. And Paul speaks about the challenges in his work, all right? We think we've got it tough. So, so Paul says, so, are they Christian servants? I sound like a madman, he says, but I am, better, I am a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more. I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 30 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. And once I was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks. And once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers in danger from fellows and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers in the high seas and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have been without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter or clothing. But not to mention other things, every day, I'm under the pressure of my concerns for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with, with distress. So St. Paul had many challenges in his work. I don't know whether he had to walk into a year six classroom now or into a kindergarten classroom like, like um, and many of you have to do. I'm going to share now a screen with you on the, uh, my talk. This is my topic. And um, uh, the Apostle one of the ones allowed at Mass on Sunday. It's one of the oldest expressions of Christian belief, systematic Christian belief. And so we, to begin, I think we might begin with a prayer now and we might uh, pray this, this prayer. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We might pray this, just pray quietly in your hearts uh, as, as we begin this, um, this session. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Now, this creedal formula didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of the fermentation and the reflection of the early church, and we'll examine some of those, those documents and some of those witnesses to the scriptures uh, in, our, in our talk today. But I think we need to take a step back because Christianity came out of the Judaic milieu, 
And it was in that milieu that Jesus uh, grew and came to his own self-knowledge and understanding. So I'd, I'd invite you now just to reflect on this uh, ancient text from Deuteronomy, which identified uh, who the people of God were. Listen, Israel, Yahweh our God is the one Yahweh. You shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Let these words I urge you today be written on your heart. You shall repeat them to your children and say them over to them, whether at rest in your house or walking abroad, at your lying down or at your rising. You shall fasten them to your hand as a sign and on your forehead as a slipplet. You shall write them on your doorposts of your houses and on your gates. So it's a, a creedal formula that says things about God and says things about us. And we'll see through our reflection today how creedal formulas are very important have a lasting on upon us in what we believe and how we Christian pay. Up very ancient during our preparation for priesthood we have this American scripture scholar and he used to quote this passage at us all the time because it identified who the people of God were. And um, he used to say, an American accent, he used to say, my father was a wandering Arab man. He went down into Egypt to find refuge there, few in number. But there he became a nation great and mighty and strong. The Egyptians ill-treated us. They gave us no peace and inflicted harsh slavery on us. But we called on Yahweh, the God of our fathers, Yahweh heard our, our voice and saw our misery, our toil and our oppression. And Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with mighty hand and outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us here and gave us this land, a land where milk and honey flow. Here then... I bring the first fruits of the produce of the soil that you, Yahweh, have given me. So we can see that, that link with the, the, from the slavery in Egypt to the land of promise. And you'll notice in the creedal formulas that we reflect on that this is a common theme, stating the story. Where do we come from? And in this text from Deuteronomy, we see that this is a profession of faith that re reminds Israel of the, the divine choice of deliverance from Egypt and the gift of the promised land. And these, um, these, these texts are a creedal text. They, they say who we are, what's happened to us, and where we're going. And so we come now to to look at some of the New Testament texts and we see in the Acts of the Apostles, in very early in the Acts of the Apostles, for this reason, and Christ. The Acts of the early writings teaching they reflect on the on the basic mysteries of our faith and they try to explain them in ways that that help those who don't believe or don't know to come to understanding and come to faith so we'll, we'll look at um in that reading the acts of possibly in nine in chapter nine paul preaches Jesus is the Son of God. Very, we, we, we are used to these words, but preaching these words at this time would have set quite a contrast and quite a challenge to many of the hearers. 
and we have um, here in the in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter thirteen. In um, we have this uh, this charismatic teaching, the basic teaching of of the uh, of the time, and um, I'll read uh, read some of it for you so you, you get the flavour. Men of Israel, the fearers of God, listen. The God of our nations, Israel, chose our ancestors and made our people great when they were living as foreigners in Egypt. Then by divine power, he led them out. And for about 40 years, he took care of them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in Canaan and put them in possession of their land, for about 450 years. After this, he gave them judges down to the prophet Samuel. Then they demanded a king, and God gave them Saul, king of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. After 40 years, he deposed them and made David the king. So you can see it goes on to, um, to telling the story and proclaiming the message. To keep his promise, God has raised up from Israel one of David's descendants, Jesus as Saviour, whose coming was heralded by John when he proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the whole people of Israel. Before John ended his career, he said, I am not the one you imagine me to be. That one is coming after me, and I am not fit to undo his sandals. So he's pointing the way to who Jesus is. And in, in first, uh, first Corinthians, um, we, we find again a very uh, early creedal formula, formulating the faith, trying to explain our faith in ways that people would know and, and come to understand. Well then in the first place, we see in the in first Corinthians, I taught you what I had been taught myself, namely, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared first to Cephas and secondly to the twelve. Next he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time and most of them are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me. It was as though I was born when no one expected it. That's um, a Paul reflecting on his faith. And the, um, the conversion of St. Paul is recorded three times in the, in the, um, in the scriptures. It was such an, an, an important event, his conversion, and then, of course, then his preaching. And he goes on uh, to be one of the most outstanding witnesses to the faith ever. And, of course, that, that faith is the faith that we share. And so we're caught up in that, in that love of God. And... Um, just again to 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 um, to I suppose place our texts and uh, the texts that we use in the mass and in the liturgy and especially in when we say the creed place it in the context of the scriptures and we have here in Philippians a very ancient a Christian hymn and Paul uses it to emphasise the spirit and what we have in common, our love of the faith, our common purpose, our common mind. And he mentions divine pre-existence, incarnation, death, glorification, adoration by the cosmos, and the new title, Lord. And this text will be very familiar to you. And I think it's good to, you know, when we listen to the, um, when we pray the Mass, when we listen to, to, um, to teaching or to, um, to reflection of how, um, how in tune with the scriptures our faith is and how we're, you know, our faith grows from the word of God and the experience of the early church. 
both scripture and tradition. And so it flows out in, in what we believe and, and how we express our belief. <clears throat> so I'll read um, and reflect on this uh, Philippians text. His state was divine, yet he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave and became as men are. And being as all men are, he was humbly yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name which is above all other names, so that all beings in the heavens and on the earth and in the underworld should bend the knee at the name of Jesus and that every tongue should acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, can't we see the creedal context of this, that these uh, scriptures uh, speak to us um, of, of our own professions of faith? And, um, and they, they think that that was probably an ancient hymn sung in the early church, and either Paul composed it or he came across it, experienced it in the early church, and, um, and he then, of course, uses it and repeats it repeats it when he's um, in this letter to the Philippian community. And it's good to remember how the church grew. People of faith went to different places, preached the gospel, shared their faith, and, and a community grew up in that place. And each community was different. And each community had its own challenges, its own issues, its own things that they had to answer, different questions in different places at different times. And remember, they didn't have the means of communication by which we're sharing today. They didn't have this, this, this instant um, transmission of faith. And in the ancient times, it would have been by sending an emissary, so a person. And that person might take with them some documents, some scrolls, some ancient papyrus reeds, uh, you know, um, uh, papyrus um, sheaves that then that community would, would would then use in their liturgy or in their worship. So there wasn't a commonality um, right across the uh, the ancient world. So very different communities arising in different places at different times. And um, it's a little question. Now, when was the when was the Bible? Who decided what was in the Bible? It's an enormous question because you have different, different manuscripts in different places and, and used by different members of the church. So it wasn't proclaimed until much later, back, back in the 1500s, 1600s, until it was settled, you know, what was in the Bible. There were many texts that could have been in the Bible. So that's just an example of how um, our modern eyes we look, at, we look at things as if they're all settled questions, but they, but they weren't. And in, the ancient, um, in the ancient times, there was an emergence of creedal formula in the early church. And uh, in researching this, this little talk, I was just fascinated. The whole area, people have written books, books, whole books on this, on, on just one aspect of, of the creeds. And uh, the, the research has been extraordinary in, in delving into, well, where do our texts come from? What's their tradition? Where do they, who formulated them and for what reason? And so we have uh, in, the Christian, in the Christian tradition, um, many different communities emerging at different times, different preachers, different texts of the sacred scriptures, and different issues in their communities. So each community would then have to define itself, would have to, um, you know, say who they are and, um, and, and come to a, um, an understanding of what they believe. And so creeds, as they emerged historically, were never intended as a complete 
summary of the Christian faith in all aspects, all right? So they were, were always a partial. It's like trying to tell your family story. You know, you might have an abbreviated or a simplified version of that that you share with, with people. <coughs> and, um, that, you know, the full story is another thing, isn't it? The story of your family. And we find in the creeds, I'll just have a little drink here. We find that most of the creeds follow the, um, the, the threefold baptismal command of the Lord. Go baptise in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so we, um, we find that that's, that's often the way that the, um, the creedal formulas are, are set out. And this follows on from, from, from Juda Judaism and from the Old Testament, from the Gospel and the New Testament re revelations. And the kerygma, I uh, left out a G there, and the kerygma of the apostolic age, the teaching. And you find that basic teaching always after Easter uh, in the weekday masses and the Sunday masses, you find that it, the church goes back to those original statements of the apostles in, in the evangelical teaching about Jesus, about what he believes. So we now we so we come to the, the creed. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty. So creator and, and then they qualify that creator of heaven and earth. So the, the God of creation. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. So using uh, the words only Son and Lord qualify who Jesus is, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, teaching from the Scriptures, born of the Virgin Mary, historical fact, and has suffered under Pontius Pilate. So again, it, it, it puts Jesus in the context of reality and of the world was crucified, died, and was buried. Now again, that simplified form. of, And in the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell. And we'll talk about that a bit later. I've always been a bit fascinated with those, with those words, so we'll talk about that a bit later. On the third day, he rose again from him. He ascended into heaven again, attesting the scripture. Seated at the right hand of God, Father Almighty, again attested to in the scriptures. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. So uh, it's a forward looking aspect, looking to the end of time. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. You think of the text of Matthew, you know, where, where, where Jesus puts there, where he tells the story of the, the um, sheep and the goats, you know, at that time when all things are made. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church. Did I make a spelling mistake there? Catholic? It's not denominational. The ancient text, Catholic meant universal. All right? So it's not a, not a denominational sense. So we've got to be careful how we read the scriptures and how we read uh, the, the texts of the church. Um, the communion of saints, so belonging to that great great band of people, some on earth, some in heaven. We're all called saints. We see them the, in the early, um, early descriptors there that Paul spoke about the saints, you know, the saints being us, the saints being those who have been faithful. The forgiveness of sins, so important in the life and ministry of Jesus, reflected in the life of John the Baptist, and life everlasting. Amen. And so... How did it get to this form? How did the creed get to this form? Well, it was first found, referred to in, in St. Ambrose in, in 390, uh, this form. In the present form that we just, we just read, that doesn't, um, isn't attested to until St. Primus in the early 8th century. So there was a lot of development, a lot of discussion, a lot of cre different creedal formulas uh, used uh, um, before this time, and so we're um, we're we're um, part of a long tradition. But all the scholars seem to 
agree that the present form of the of the Apostles' Creed is found in the old Roman creed, the baptismal rite. And these questions would be very familiar to you when we'll book speak about why. And this is attested to by in the tradition of Hippolytus, one of the early writers. And um, so that's that's very early on, 215. But they 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 think that this this formula was used from from say 100 one, 150 in Rome, so this is that's why it's called the Apostles' Creed because it goes uh, so much to the history of our church. So the questions asked of those who are to be baptized: Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? We know what the answer to that is. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit? Well, has been crucified under Pontius Pilate, died, and later was added in was, and was buried, who on the third day rose again alive from the dead, ascended into heaven, and took his seat at the right hand of the Father, and shall come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Church and the resurrection of the body in the Holy Spirit? Again, so so this is um, you know very early form uh, and is attested to. So um, the some of the ancient documents they only get bits of them. They don't have complete documents. So so they find in in different writers of the ancient world these scraps of manuscript that they can put together uh, these. Um, these formulations of faith and what what um, characterizes the the um, the old Roman creed was how short it was and um, the Roman tradition is that of brevity and uh, there's some of the comments of the um, of the visiting clerics coming from the east and west and from different parts of the church was how simple the Roman rite is how sort of pared down. And when you think of it, we're going through this COVID experience at the moment. And, you know, I, I said mass this morning and we were able to have mass prayerfully said in 20 minutes. I don't know on Sunday, you know, conscious that people shouldn't be together too much or for too long. On Sundays, uh, with all our prayers and all our readings and with the sermon, you know, 30 to 35 minutes. Now, in the ancient world, and even to this day, some of the um, Eastern Rite liturgies and the Divine liturgies would go for three hours. You know, that, and so we, but we come from this Roman tradition, which is, which is a pared down, shorter, uh, more right things. And, of course, the Trinitarian formula we notice in, 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 the, in that text. And, you know, they date it from originating from the Church of Rome about 150 and eventually this developed into the fuller uh, uh, creed that we now call the, the apostles creed um, and saint ambrose says of says of, of the creeds this creed is the spiritual seal our heart's meditation and ever present time it is unquestionably the treasure of our souls. It was like a seal. And in the ancient times, if you were uh, made a bond with someone, you'd, you'd break something in half. And so you both had a part of that. And when, when, you, when you put it together, it was the whole. And um, in the ancient world, uh, there was much discussion about what different communities believed. And so throughout the ancient world, uh, different communities, as I said, grew up in different ways with different sets of beliefs and understandings of the faith and different teachings. And um, there, there is um, an enormous um, discussion in the early church about creedal formulas. I can't stress that enough. And you might say, oh, it was just an academic thing. No, it wasn't just an ac ac academic thing. Workers on the dock would have chants as they were unloading the vessels. 
and, and saying what they believed. And, um, and there was much discussion and, and it, it's a whole area of, of debate. And there were many different creeds developed in the ancient, in the ancient world. Again, addressing different things and different issues. And so that the basic purpose of a, of a creed is that it is a, a token that identified God, the believer, and the community of belief. So it's very much a communal aspect and, and the person is situated in that, in that community and identifying um, what and who, who, uh, what and who uh, they believe in. And um, so the use of the creed today, so how do we use the, the creed today? Well, it's used in our liturgy. And um, the liturgy is very interesting. When I went to, um, when I went to look at the, the use of the things, even the version in, in our missal at present uh, is, is, um, is a version. So a version of the Apostles' Creed, not the full Apostles' Creed, but a version of the Apostles' Creed that's used um, when we renew our, our vows at Easter time. So on our, and remember on Easter Sunday, the priest gets to sprinkle you all after you renew your, your baptismal vows. And it's interesting, and I often use it at special masses or on occasions when you want to emphasise what we hold in common, what unites us. And the, it, it's a, it has become a template for the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is referred to as CCC, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, when I was preparing this talk, I met um, Anita yesterday and she said, oh, good, you're going to give us a blow-by-blow -blow description of the creed. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow because it's all set out in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All right. And, and um, the, uh, the, 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 the teaching of the catechism is basically going through the creed. So it's, it's what we believe. And, it, and it's very documented. And the great thing about it, after each section, it's got an in-brief. So the in-brief often just gives you the distilled down teaching of the church references. And I can't tell you how heavily referenced is this uh, work of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it's a great tool for us as teachers, as us, for us as believers, uh, to, to help us understand our faith. And of course, the great role of a catechist is to take the teaching of the scriptures, the teaching of the church, the lived experience of faith, and transmit that in a way that is appropriate, that is age appropriate, culturally sensitive, and is consistent with our mandate as catechists. And uh, I don't know, in, in Sydney, everyone has a little green card. I don't know what you receive uh, in, your, um, in your parish or in your diocese, but all, all catechists, accredited catechists, have the little green card. And that little green card says that they are accredited as a catechist, and so they can teach in the name of, of the community of the church. So it means that they need to have done their proper formation and that they need to continue their formation, that they are then commissioned by, by their parish, and the parish is commissioned by the bishop to teach and to share their faith. And so it's very important that we you always are culturally sensitive and that we use age-appropriate materials when we're teaching and only approved materials so that we are in full communion with the church and with our diocese and with our parish. And um, so those, those, um, those curriculums that we use, they come down from the teaching of the church and they're still down. And just to bring you up to date, We've just received news that there is a new catechetical directory that's been released by the Vatican. <coughs> and it's a directory for catechists. And um, don't get too excited because, uh, unfortunately, 
it uh, hasn't been translated into English yet, where the last language was. Well, it was out in all sorts of other languages. So if you have other languages, you can look it up. But the English version is yet to come. And so it's a new catechetical directory, which will affect how we teach, what we teach, and the way in which we teach. And it comes from the renewal of the Second Vatican Council. And um, there was a directory uh, of catechesis put out in 1931 under Pope, uh, St. Pope Paul VI. And then again in the, the Catechism of the Church came out in 1993. And there's very few other faiths that will put their teaching out there for everyone to see and covering so many different questions and so many different issues. And then <clears throat> uh, Pope St. John Paul uh, produced a, a directory in 1997. And now we have this, this new directory of catechesis that will really help us in our work. And there are three main parts to it. There is a focus on our relationship between the catechists and the church's mission of evangelization. Right, so that's the first part. The second part um, of the document focuses on the process of catechesis. And it contains uh, things about how we teach and um, references to the catechism and the, the catechetical methodology and the recipients of catechesis across their life. And that's one of the things this document says, that we don't, we need to keep learning. We need to keep learning as Christians and as Catholics, we need to. And, um, uh, and the third part, the final part of that document is to do with the catechesis in particular churches. So again, referencing the, our own particular situation. And when the Catechism of the Catholic Church was put out originally, the, um, the mandate was that each, each um, national church should develop resources from that and each diocese then should um, produce uh, materials so that the teaching speaks to the people of the time and that's always our challenge. And, um, and so the new directory should be a very... Uh, should help us with our ongoing kerygma, the core, the saving message of Jesus and in the process of, of, of teaching and evangelising in the world and it, and it makes that emphasis. And, um, of course, it, it teaches the catechesis throughout the lifespan. It also speaks about um, the articulation of our faith in a modern world and the digital culture that we're using now, aren't we? Who, who thought we'd be doing this sort of thing? But we are, the modern technology. And also it goes on to speak about the catechesis of adults. So I'm really looking forward to that new document and hopefully we will have um, some further reflections on that. Um, and as we, um, as we reflect on that. And so the, the, the Apostles' Creed is, is, <coughs> is important. And it can be used in our, it is used in our, in our liturgy of baptism. Uh, it's a template for the, for, the, for the catechism of the Catholic Church. It's a basis of our catechetical instruction. We renew our baptismal vows at Easter, Easter Vigil and on Easter Sunday and then on other special occasions. Uh, it, we, can, oh, we can proclaim the Apostles' Creed at Sunday Mass and it is suggested especially during Lent and Easter Tide in preparation for the renewal of our baptismal vows. And of course, in the recitation of the rosary, that's one of those introductions uh, for that. Now, I'm just gonna share um, the, the a document that just shows you the difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the Nicene Creed. That is a whole other area of dis discussion and reflection. You can see how the Apostles' Creed is shorter, is, is simpler, and is more direct. See the differences there in the, in the, in the, two, in the two models.
Now, it's good to see them side by side. It'd be, it would have been good to have the, um, the old Roman creed there as well, but that was a bit beyond my, my capabilities, unfortunately. But it's, it's very interesting when you put text together. I've got a great book here. It's called The Harmony of the Gospels. So every gospel story that, that's common, they, they, um, they show uh, how each, each, each evangelist uses that story and what they put in, what they leave out, what their emphasis is. So I think that's a great example of the, um, the use of text and how um, there's a commonality and yet often a difference. And we're doing um, the Gospel of Matthew this year, aren't we? And who was Matthew's audience, do I think? I think it was a very Jewish audience. So people literate in the Jewish faith. And therefore, he makes many references, many, many references to the Old Testament. And you'll, you'll, you'll pick that up uh, throughout the preaching and teaching this year and hearing that, that, that message. Now, I'd like to take, um, I'd like to take one phrase from the um, from the uh, from the uh, from the Apostles' Creed, one that's always fascinated me a little bit. And um, <coughs> he descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. So we noticed that wasn't in the old Roman Creed, didn't we? It wasn't in the old Roman Creed, but it is in it is in the Apostles' Creed. So um, hell. Uh, Sheol in the Hebrew, a place of shadows. You know? so, and in Greek, Hades in Greek. Um, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that he descended there as saviour. Good news to free the just who have gone before him. So he, he, he goes down. It, it sort of troubles some people. They say, oh, gee, that Jesus went down to hell because he's God of heaven and earth. God of everything, and, he, and that cosmic, that whole cosmic dimension. And it brings that gospel message, it's brought to its fulfilment that Jesus has come for all. And um, if, you, if, you look up, if you look up that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you'll find it's replete with, with ex, uh, in very uh, biblical texts. And so it quotes and references. And I just got a little bit there from the from the from the Catechism itself, where it says, "Christ, the firstborn from the dead, is the principle of our own resurrection." <coughs> Even now, the, the justification of our souls, and one day of the new life He will impart uh, to our bodies. And so, again, uh, again, that references to see how heavily it, it's referenced to the scriptures uh, in the, in the, as I said before. Um, and look, we're coming to the, I'm coming to the end of my time allowance here. I'm conscious of that, and uh, and so I just invite you now to um, just to renew the vows of your of your baptism. All right. So, do you believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the, the dead and life everlasting? I do. Now, did I make a spelling mistake there? No, that was what well, that was. That was what was in the missile. <laughs> they put a capital C there. I don't know. Well, I don't know whether it's a typo or um, or, or why. So, and and just uh, we say thank you. So um, so I, I think that's some food for you to think about, and I hope that's been helpful in your understanding of the text of of the context of the text and your homework is now to go and to read that part of the catechism and uh, you know, meditate on it and um, come to a deeper understanding and love of it yourselves. Well, thank you for the opportunity for this. As a priest of many years, 
it was great to do a bit of study and hit the books and to, you know, just reflect on things myself. And uh, it was a, so I thank you for the opportunity to do that. So we might pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for all your gifts. We thank you for the gifts of faith. We ask that you be with us now, especially during this time of difficulty and challenge in our church, in our world, in our community. We pray that you would be with all those who are responding to the needs of others and serving others in love. We pray that you keep them safe that you restore to help those who are sick and those who are suffering. And in the end, we might uh, give the, do the glory. But I always like to do this one as Kelly, because we might bring, bring our hands together. If you can follow me and do, say this and do this together. Ready? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.